In spite of vast achievements in our modern, sophisticated world, there persists here and there a strange phenomenon. In countries otherwise prospering and advancing in technology, there are isolated groups of people living lives virtually untouched by the progress in civilization all around them. They use simple tools handed down through the generations. They feed animals mouth to mouth, even nurse them at the breast. They live almost as animals, and it's revolting to us, accustomed as we are to different standards of behavior. The brutal binding of babies' heads to change their shape would be an unspeakable crime in our society as would the crude sharpening of teeth or the tattooing of infants' faces. And yet these things are being done today for reasons incomprehensible to us. Nor do we understand open flirtation with disease in areas where disease is epidemic. By chewing the starchy roots of certain plants and spitting the mash into a vat, a fermentation process is started which results in a contaminated but potent brew. Such things are common in many parts of our world, but why? Why these strange cultural phenomena in a day of scientific discovery and advancement? These things invite inquiry, study, and explanation. The staff of Moody Institute of Science has journeyed to remote areas of the world by almost every available means to look for answers, to study the so-called primitive peoples, and to record evidence of their strange ways of life, of their spiritual nightmares, of lives dominated by witch doctors, of lives that hang by a slender thread because of tribal and family feuds, because of malnutrition, because of disease. And the more we have studied these people, the more thoughtful we have become about what to call them. What would you call these people? Is this the noble savage? This the idyllic pastoral scene? Would you call these people primitives? It's a popular concept, has been since the 18th century. But think of the implications. Calling these people primitives implies that what they are, we once were. And what we are today, these people with the passage of time will inevitably become. It further implies that they have been held back by some environmental factor such as climate, poverty, disease. In other words, to call these people primitives suggests that they have been caught to one side in an eddy and temporarily held back from the progress that is thought by many, always to accompany the passage of time. But is this true? How will such a belief stand up under investigation? Let's put it to the test. In Chiapas State, in the jungles of southern Mexico, near the Guatemalan border, there's a tribe of people known as the Lacandones. The Lacandones were once regarded as among the most primitive peoples on Earth. So we pose the question, are these people starting their long upward climb towards civilization? Has their environment held them back? Fortunately, information is now available concerning these people. Their language has been studied, their custom, their physical characteristics, and authorities are agreed that the Lacandones are direct descendants of the once great and glorious Mayas. 
They live now where their ancestors lived centuries ago. They speak almost the same language. Their religion is obviously distorted and twisted, but they still hold sacred the ruins of ancient Mayan cities. There was a time when hundreds of these cities were spread across Central America, along with thousands of smaller villages. Cities such as Tikal, cities which were flourishing when Pompeii was buried. The Maya civilization was forming possibly as early as 1500 BC, but the culture reached its peak between 300 BC and 800 to 900 AD. It included the countries now known as El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and British Honduras, plus the Mexican states of Chiapas, Tabasco, and Yucatan. Mayan ruins have been discovered throughout virtually this entire area. But even at their best, ruins are similar to the last pages of a history book. They tell us nothing of how it all began. And they give us only a glimmer, only a hint of the glory which once must have been. The Mayas produced an architecture that ranks high in human achievement. But the Mayas were not only accomplished architects, they were also astronomers and mathematicians of amazing competence. Over a period of hundreds or perhaps thousands of years, the Mayas kept the most detailed and accurate records of the movement of the sun, the moon, and the planets. Have you ever thought of all that is necessary to accurately predict the time and place of a solar eclipse? It's really quite a feat and one which the Mayas had mastered thousands of years ago. In the Dresden Codex, one of the few remaining Mayan manuscripts, is a record of solar eclipses for a 23-year cycle. At the end of the cycle, the table could be used again. And what may be even more amazing is the fact that they were able to compute the synodic period of the planet Venus with an error of less than one four hundredths of a second per day. Those familiar with the highly complex celestial mechanics involved cannot but stand in awe of the magnitude of such an achievement. Some of this information was recorded in stone. Here in Old Chichen are the ruins of the Temple of the Initial Series. On the underside of this stone is an inscription Actually, it's a date, July 28, 878 A.D. This may seem like a lot of rigmarole just to record a single date. But incorporated in this inscription are a number of important facts about the Mayan people. First, it indicates something of their antiquity. This date gives the total number of days which had elapsed since the initial date in Mayan history a period of nearly 4,000 years. The inscription also reveals something of the mathematical genius of the Mayas. In Mayan mathematics, dots are ones, bars are five. This number, three dots and two bars, is 13. With this in mind, it's easy to identify 10 Two, nine, one, nine, seven. But there's something else here. A mathematical principle without which we would have no computers today. In mathematics, it's referred to as a positional system. Each time we step up a notch, we multiply by 20. This glyph is equivalent to 100 and 44,000 days. This brings us to the crowning achievement of the Mesoamerican culture, the concept of the zero. 
Western civilization didn't have the zero until the Middle Ages, when the Phoenicians brought it into Europe from the Hindus. By that time, the Mayas had been using it for at least a thousand years. Yes, the Maya civilization was truly astounding. They were a great people. But also among the ruins, we find clear evidence of moral decay. These pictures adorn the walls of the temple at Banampak. Here we find the oft-repeated story of disregard for the value of human life. These are captives pleading for mercy, but they plead in vain. The Mayan ruler tells them they must die. Human sacrifice. Hearts were torn from people's bodies and offered still pulsating to the Mayan gods. Stone gods such as Chakmul, the Mayan god of rain. Idols thought by the later Mayas to have insatiable appetites for human blood. In the final days of the Mayan culture, these became the faces of doom. People were slaughtered by the tens of thousands. In 1527, when Cortez's captain rode into Yucatan, he found a decadent society. With a handful of men, he conquered a vast number of people, a nation that had crumbled from within. And today, as we study these last pages, which tell us not only of achievement, but also of decay, we can only imagine the orderliness of the society as it rose to greatness. But we no longer ponder the question, is the Lacandona primitive? We now know he's a decadent, a dropout of a once proud people. The evidence indicates that the Lacandone is on his way down, not up, and it's been a long, tragic descent. But now we leave the jungles of southern Mexico and fly across the equator into South America, to the country of Peru, to the land of the Andes Mountains. Here in this forbidding landscape of glaciated rock, and valleys that rise to rarefied heights just below the mountaintops, we find another group of so-called primitive people. These are the Cachuas, who for the most part are content to spend their lives in servitude, caring for the possessions of others. There are some five million of these people, many of whom are addicted to the narcotic cocaine. This is one drug about which there is no question. It destroys the body and the mind. It traps the user in a cycle which cannot be broken. But there seems to be no desire on the part of the Quechua to do anything but remain numb, anesthetized to life. So we ask again, are these primitive people or could these too be decadents? Where the city of Cusco now stands in this same country of Peru, the ancestors of the Quechua established the center of an empire which was to become legend, the realm of the Inca, one of the world's great civilizations. It is said that once this valley was a dazzling spectacle, rooftops of gold reflected the sun in the clear mountain air. The city itself was connected to other parts of the empire by a complex network of roads, one of which, the Royal Road of the Inca, was 3,250 miles long, longer than the Roman Road, which ran from Scotland to Jerusalem. All of this despite the fact that there were no wheels, no horses. The common denominator was the hoof of the llama and the feet of the Indian and these account for much of the traffic even today. Much of modern-day Cusco is built on Incan remains. The Inca built almost entirely of stone, and with such precision, mortar was unnecessary. The massive boulders of Sac Suleiman were fitted together in a manner which speaks of great engineering skill and technical competence. They remain intact 
in spite of the many earthquakes that have twisted and heaved the ground beneath. Saksuaman was a fortress designed by the builders to guard and control an important mountain pass leading to the city of Cusco. In the center of the fortress, we find additional evidence of engineering genius, a water system that has lasted for centuries and is still intact. We may think of brain surgery as a rather recent accomplishment, but skulls have been found in ancient Peruvian burial grounds, which yield astonishing evidence, not only of brain surgery, but of bone regeneration following surgery. In other words, successful brain surgery was realized even before the time of Christ. Trepanning was amazingly well-developed as a surgical technique allowing bone removal from the skull in a number of different ways. The bronze instruments used were well designed. Recently, these ancient instruments were used by a South American surgeon. When the patient died some four years later from an unrelated cause, the skull was carefully examined. Bone regeneration was evident. The operation had been a complete success as had many operations performed with similar instruments thousands of years ago. Seashell trumpets echo through the mountains here, as they must have during ancient religious festivals. They remind us of the close of another era, a mysterious chapter in the history of the Incas, for this is the city of Machu Picchu, a fortress sanctuary, a hideaway on the top of a mountain. Because Machu Picchu was to remain isolated from the rest of the world, it was carefully planned to be self-sufficient. Terraced fields were built for the growing of needed food. Rain was plentiful. Stone flumes carried spring water to every home. In fact, Machu Picchu was a city of stone, stone that was quarried a considerable distance away, up the Yurubamba Gorge, and then somehow taken to the top of the mountain. There it was generously used for building palaces, temples, gabled houses, stairways, and at least in those last days, there were torture chambers and altars for human sacrifices. Stone was also used for building parapets and towers, towers from which to guard the city, towers from which to sound the alarm. Even though the Incas were almost certain to have had enemies, it is doubtful that the alarm sounded often for Machu Picchu, because the location of the fortress virtually guaranteed security. On three sides, access was denied by sheer cliffs, plunging down 2,000 feet to the Yurubamba River. On the one remaining side, there was a mountain. But all this security merely destined Machu Picchu to become a symbol of a last retreat. Because in spite of its intelligent organization and great military strength, the Inca civilization was unable to guard itself from corruption within. There was no security against lust for power among the rulers or hatred and violence among the people themselves. And in the early 1500s, a divided kingdom collapsed. All the realm, that is, except Machu Picchu. The Spanish never knew it existed. A group of chosen women called the Virgins of the Sun lived out their lives here in utter seclusion after the empire had fallen. Then for centuries, the city remained as you see it, silent, and empty.
to be discovered by accident in the year 1903. Machu Picchu, a mysterious monument to architectural genius, a building accomplishment never duplicated by another civilization. So what of the Quechua, this descendant of such an accomplished people? Which way has he traveled? Again, the evidence points to down, not up. Are these isolated cases or are we dealing with a universal principle, something so basic that it cannot be ignored? To answer this question, it is necessary first to plot the technical and cultural achievements of various civilizations against the time span of recorded history. And then using this data, establish the pattern for an average civilization. In the average civilization, there is a gradual rise to a peak of accomplishment, followed by a somewhat sudden collapse. Comparing individual civilizations to this average will reveal how closely they conform to the norm. Egypt, land of the pharaohs and the world's first centralized government, Babylon, contributor to the development of the sundial, the potter's wheel, the vault, the dome and the arch. Phoenicia, a nation of commerce and source of the English alphabet. Greece, birthplace of democracy, Land of Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Rome. All her vaunted legions could not stop the decay from within. Inca. Outstanding for its organizational and engineering skill. Maya. Intellectual giants of Central America. Why this pattern? Why should civilization after civilization rise to heights of magnificence only to suffer a devastating collapse? For centuries, it was assumed that the prime factor in the fall of civilizations was moral and spiritual decay. However, about a century ago, there began a concerted effort to demonstrate that factors other than moral and spiritual decadence were of primary importance. Factors such as widespread epidemic, change in trade routes, agricultural depletion, earthquake, famine, disrupted ecology, or any one of a dozen other reasons, that these were responsible for the downfall. Now, there can be no question that many of these factors have been involved in the downfall of civilizations. But once again, were they the primary cause? It is interesting to note that when a civilization is in the vigor of its ascendancy, these very things many times stimulate and strengthen rather than overwhelm. But then there comes that time when a civilization is no longer able to meet the challenge when the moral and spiritual foundation so necessary for a civilization to thrive becomes eroded. And when that happens, the least type of adversity can cause it to topple. One thing then comes through loud and clear. The idea of ever onward and upward is just not borne out by past history. Time is not the savior. To the evidence of history can be added the clear statements of the Bible, the infallible word of God. This book teaches time and again the cause and effect relationship of moral and spiritual corruption to a civilization's collapse. According to this book, nations and civilizations fall because they as a people turn from God and from his law. 
and attempt to build an adequate way of life according to their own efforts. The cycle of collapse we see in history is the inevitable result of that course of action. But there is an alternative. If the cause of collapse is turning from God, the cure is turning to God. To the nation Israel, God said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. God's remedy works for nations because it is formulated to meet the need of the individual. What, after all, are empty cities but the sum total of individual empty lives? Pascal, the world-renowned French philosopher and mathematician, said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in every heart. And of course, only God can fill that. So if your life is empty, just as empty and desolate as the empty cities that dot our world, turn to God. In a direct, deliberate act of the will, ask Jesus Christ, God's Son, to be your personal Savior and Lord. And Christ will change the whole direction of your life from a demoralizing descent to a dynamic ascent. Jesus Christ stands ready at this very moment to fill your life with his liberating truth and love. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and all things have become new. Think what this could mean to you as an individual. Think what this could mean to all of us as a nation. And just think what this could mean to our world today.